Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Um, do I have to yeah, turn this on? Okay. Testing. One, two. I don't feel. Okay. It was, it was a great fight, Mom, but I lost. <laughs> Remember that old line? Pray for the Facebook generation. They don't know what real humor is. I am uh, very honored to be here because your pastor has an unbelievable reputation within the Bible-believing circles. You may not know that, but he's known for having graduated from Dr. Ruckman's school and having been thought highly of by Dr. Ruckman. Of course, Alan Ryman was thought highly about, about you know, <laughs> so I don't know. But uh, long story short, he's uh, been well known for having come to an insane part of the world. How many of you know this is the land of fruits and nuts? Yeah. Okay, I grew up in New York City. We drove stolen cars in driver's ed class there. But this place makes New York look like a kindergarten for craziness. And so having come out here, survived, and then stuck it out for going on three decades or more now. So you may not know it, but you have a good reputation as a church. And, uh, you know, none of us are worth a dynamite to blow us up. But God magnifies his servants for his work. He magnified Joshua. So he makes us look bigger than we are. But... I, and listen, uh, your pastor was teaching the other day at the Bible Institute where I taught the night before, and I was, I'm as burned out as anybody else these days, you know, running around, but I asked if it was okay if I sat in on his classes. I didn't want to be a distraction as an outside person, but they said, sure, and I sat there through 90, two 90-minute classes and learned, learned some things that I didn't know before, and I enjoyed it immensely. So, you know, when, when God's extra good to us, we get spoiled. So you need to hear from somebody else about how good things are. Amen. Was there anything else, Pastor? <laughs> you know, you don't think I'd say that if I didn't feel I could, I know the man. What, he's a man's man. He's got a tattoo on his arm when tattoos weren't the thing to do. They were the things you did when you were a man, okay? But anyway, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I really am. So don't let me overdo it, but I've been looking forward to this. I've been looking forward to it, mostly because uh, the stronger a church is connected to Brother Ruckman, the more books I sell. Yeah, I do. I circulate in the Bible Belt a lot. Say what now? I'm a telling you, neighbor. You know, and they know about shouting and running the aisles, and they're pretty good people, but they don't usually read much. So I've got to make up for those bad days by coming to Ruckman churches. And, and uh, for, you know, so anyway, <clears throat> and I've already recognized many of you have my books already just from 20 minutes of talking to you. So I appreciate that. So I want to encourage you, if you're able, if you're able, before the end of the day, I'll be here tonight uh, to get some books, even if you have them, to help circulate them. I got a letter from Judge Roy Moore one time, a neighbor of his, heard me preach and got my What If God Wrought book to him, and I got a nice letter from Senator Jesse Helms before he died. Some preacher got him a copy of What If God Wrought. He told me he was reading it during Christmas. Col uh, Colonel Oliver North was on a, leading a Holy Land trip the other day, and a preacher I, I preached for in Texas gave him a copy of Holy Ground, the Israel book, and he was a saved man, yeah. Colonel North. said, you can't, we never, politics will never straighten the world out. Only the second coming of Christ will straighten it out. That's what he said in a, in a Holy Land tour, you know, Bible study. Amen. So, um, you know, Sean Hannity has a copy of What If God Wrought, believe it or not. Some preacher out in Long Island, a Ruckman guy, one of his church members gave him a copy of it, one of uh, Sean Hannity's own book signings for something he wrote. Meaning, you know, the, the Lord gave the word, great was the company that published it. That's the Gideon's verse about the Bible. But God wouldn't get mad if you circulated some other good books about the Bible. So before the day's out, if you can get some, uh, please do so. I, I make it easy. I take debit cards. People ask me that all the time. I tell folks, I'll take somebody else's debit card. <laughs> if you can get your hands on it for a few minutes. Bad checks, cash, coins, I don't care. I'll take it. Don't worry about COVID. Say amen right there. Amen. All right. And any widows in the church, please come by. You'll, I always give you a free book. Glad to do that. All you got to do is pray for me. Hey, I've had, I've had, you have to be, you have to be a, you have to be a widow indeed. No wannabes. And, uh, and, uh, hey, believe it or not, hey, you don't have to make stuff up in the, tw up, up in the 21st century. I've had two men in the last year come up to my book table 
and tell me they identified as widows. And one was when I was out here in California in 2019. How could you make up stuff like that? So uh, anyway, uh, the books are, any book is $20 on the table. It's five of them. I, I found that you could sell your mother for $20. Everything's $19.95 on television. I learned that a year ago. <laughs> so uh, any book is $20. Three of those books are $30 on Amazon. The barcodes are right in the back of the book. Most of you are familiar with them, but for the sake of those of you that are not, uh, it is four books are history, religious history, the final authority, the hit, which is the history of the King James Bible. And we got 50,000 copies of those. Chick Publications just gave me an order just a couple weeks ago. 26 years they've been buying them. Uh, then we got the, um, the history of America and the Baptist. This is the one I've been talking about. Hardest book for me to keep in print, as far as the home school mothers buying them up. Baptist history and American history put together. Con the history of the conspiracy movement in America, the deep state. Uh, how Satan turned America against God. Uh, they got a picture of Satan grabbing the dome there. Yep. Now, that was put out in 2005. This just happened the other day. Yep. You all remember? Yep. Yep. Now, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, let me read something to you. It's in the second, second to the last page of the book. If you can explain this, I'll give you every book on the table. I'll throw in the table. <laughs> hey, <wait a> <laughs> I say, wait a minute. <laughs> Hey, anybody remember Mahalia Jackson? He yeah. got the whole world in his hand. Yeah. Last chapter is called The Little Bitty Baby. I'm trying to calm people down. It's a scary book. How Satan Turned America Against God. A scriptural Examination of Conspiracy History. Here's one little line here. From Osama to Obama, the Lord's got everything under control. He's got the whole wide world in his hands, okay? Now, can you explain this to me? From Osama to Obama. Got that Obama part? Yes. Well, here's what I want you to explain. If you go to the copyright page, it says 2005, which was three years before Mr. Obama got into the White House. Now, the, the, the moral of the story there is that preachers aren't as dumb as we look sometimes. <laughs> so if you want to get some heavy stuff, and by the way, how far is Brentwood from here? All right, that's where the O.J. Simpson mansion was, right? Three houses down from the O.J. Simpson mansion, two houses over from Bill, uh, uh, Steven Spielberg's horse ranch out there. There's a man that lived, lived there. He's dead now. And I'll show you his picture. Here's his picture right here, and it's me and him in his backyard in Brentwood. And this man worked on the atom bomb in 1943, and he invented the neutron bomb in 1958. He's the father of the neutron bomb one of the four horsemen of the atomic age. Albert Einstein, Robin Oppenheimer, Edward Teller, and Sam Cohen, all Jews. And uh, atom bomb, hydrogen bomb, neutron bomb. And when it comes to melting the elements, it's in the genes of the Jews that know how to do that stuff. Anyway, he wrote the afterword to this book, three page afterward at the back recommending it. He's an atheist, but uh, it's a pro-Israel book, so he wanted to help me get the thing out. And so uh, that's sitting there on the table, all about the deep state tonight. And then this is the fourth history book. Uh, this just came out three years ago, Holy Ground, uh, the True History of the State of Israel. Now, if you don't get this for any other reason, uh, I live in Tennessee, and they still think Elvis Presley's alive over there. Uh, here's a statue of the largest Elvis, here's a picture of the largest Elvis Presley statue in the world, 16 feet tall, right here. And it's sitting in an Arab village one mile outside of Jerusalem, Abu Ghush. And here's four Israeli Elvis impersonators with their jumpsuits on, yeah. posing in front of the statue. And the third one is a woman. Uh, you can't make this stuff up. But uh, anyway, this is, uh, is Rodney Dangerfield's uh, tombstone buried out here in L.A. Uh, there goes the neighborhood, it says right here. You know? <laughs> but uh, this, you know, this had, this had uh, uh, Sam Cohen in the back. This got another Sam. How many remember Son of Sam? Yeah. David Berkowitz. He's, he was also known as the 44 caliber killer. You get two monikers for your crime spree, you're a pretty bad dude. And here's a picture of him right here holding his King James Bible in prison. And he got saved about 20-something years ago, and I had the privilege of interviewing him four different times face-to-face, -face, no screen. 
And he loves the Lord tonight, but he's shooting women all over New York in 1977. Some of you remember that. But he's a Jew, Berkowitz, and he got saved, so I put him in this book. So a lot of you know Jewish, some Jewish people. Now, this is 900 pages, 200 photographs and maps. And my, uh, younger, my younger son of two sons is a detective in the Blunt County Sheriff's Department in Tennessee, and he did a time study on my schedule for the book, and he come up with 18,000 hours. So it was six years, 10 hours a day, uh, 18,000 hours. So I got a text message this morning from my wife. She said our landscaper contacted her and wanted to know, if, uh, is our lawn ready to start being mowed, how we use every year. And uh, can you imagine if somebody told you they'd sign a contract with you to mow your lawn and weed eat for six years? They would, they would commit to 18,000 hours of work, and all they wanted was one paycheck ahead of time in advance, $20 paycheck. All right? You know, what that, you know what kind of deal that would be? Let me show you the Greek word. Watch it. You're going to miss it. It's in the Greek. Watch. <laughs> so here's 18,000 hours of work. And by the way, you know what inspired me to write this? Israel, a deadly piece of dirt from Dr. Ruckman. So this is like a next level up, okay? So anyway, then there's one fifth book back there called Given by Inspiration, and that's uh, basically uh, how to understand the King James Bible correctly. And it's a real interesting, my most, my most popular book because it's the smallest. <laughs> it's 300 pages. Okay, so all that to say this, any book on the table is $20, any three books is 50, and uh, all five of them would be 90. But as I mentioned, uh, all three of these books I showed you are $90, uh, $30 on Amazon. There's the barcodes. Now, the Lord showed me, showed me something real interesting when I was uh, waiting to get up here. And you're not going to believe this. Let me tell you a real bizarre story, okay? So Dr. Ruckman uh, turns me on my head in 1988 for the King James Bible. That's exactly how I got straightened out. Some of you may know Jack Patterson, he gave me some sermon tapes by Peter Ruckman when I was, we, when I was a teacher at Howes Anderson and didn't know the issue, made fun of it. I listened to him and I was converted overnight. The man that gave him the sermon tapes was a guy named Monday at, at, at PBI, and he was the road manager for the Almond Brothers before he got saved. And so anyway, I got turned upside down because of Dr. Ruckman's influence. And by the way, my wife bought me my first King James Bible uh, three months before we got married. She's a Southern Baptist. I'm a Catholic. She bought it at a Beach Boys concert at the, Har at the Delaware State Fair in Harrington, Delaware. It came out of seeing the Beach Boys and saw a book table, flea market arrangement, you know, in a, in a, in a fair, you know. And she, she bought me a King James Bible for a wedding present. Amen. So I got, a, I got my King James Bible from the Beach Boys, and I got my King James position from the Almond Brothers. <laughs> I mean, how can you make up that stuff? And preacher, after I got my King James Bible, I was saved eight days later at the Marcus Baptist Church in Linwood, Pennsylvania, Clarence Larkin's home church, wow. where he was baptized. And then three months later, I was at Philadelphia College of the Bible, getting my dispensational teaching straightened out, the basics of it anyway, which was founded by C.I. Schofield. So I hope you connect the dots in your life, because God's been there all along. Amen. And the biggest mistake you'll ever make sitting there listening to some outside guests come in like me, you sit there and let the devil mess with your head, and then you sit there and say, man, I wish I was a preacher so I could have a lot of cool stuff like that happen to me. I want you to notice I got a pair of pants on this morning. Aren't you glad about that? <laughs> As opposed to a robe. Yeah. I'm not Schuler down here at the so-called whatever it used to be. Yeah. I'm not a Protestant. This is a Baptist church, yeah. and uh, there's no clergy and lady here. We all go to the same God through the same mediator, right? Yeah. And if you don't have some wild stories, I check my salvation out. Amen. God moves with all his children. Amen. Don't ever get, oh, a preacher can get, no, you can get the same things happening to you, and you better have them. Amen. Pastor knows that. Now, why am I telling you that story? Because I got turned upside down and wrote Final Authority. And then the Lord wrote the book Final Authority Then, because uh, my ministry was established because that book went out and went everywhere because I had a platform having taught for Jack Hiles and with, or teaching for Jack Hiles at that time. We actually snuck Dr. Ruckman's material into the fundamentalist world. <laughs> hey, ready? Truth is strange in the fiction. Dr. Ruckman counseled me not to quote him in the book, in the Final Authority book, not to cite his material. 
He said, we got to get this truth out, but don't put my name in or nobody will buy it. Amen. I didn't want to listen to him, but some good friends of mine said, you better take, take that advice. Amen. So guess what I did? I wrote Brother Ruckman a letter to ask him permission to do something, and he gave me the okay to do it. <laughs> I snuck him in <laughs> under the radar. Bill Clinton used to sneak out of the White House in the back seat of a limousine under a blanket to meet with hookers at the Marriott in Washington. Man, a man who was in charge of all the, uh, uh, the cl uh, security clearances in the White House at that time wrote a book telling about that. Now, I snuck in, I didn't, I didn't snake Dr. Ruckman to the Marriott, but I snuck him into the books. Go look at, the, look at every spine of my book, including the first one. There's Dr. Ruckman's Lion from the Revelation Commentary. I picked that from my logo for Grady Publications. And uh, that, that's always an inside joke with the Ruckman pe uh, preachers and so on. Now, I'm going somewhere with this story, though. So I, so I wrote this book because I had a platform established now, a readership. And this was on our Baptist history and American history. Well, one day, uh, uh, a young preacher in North Carolina, Rockwell, North Carolina, picked up that book and read it. And he claimed it turned him upside down in a nice way as well. And he started a ministry called the Baptist History Preservation Society. and began having Baptist history tours and, and, and erecting monuments at sacred sites where key Baptist churches were founded. And on and on it went. And then he started realizing how many Baptist men had written wonderful hymns and people never heard of them. And he began to put a hymn book together. And this is the hymn book right here. His name is not even in the book. He spent over 10 years on it, maybe longer than that. And this is one of the most unique hymn books you'll ever come across. So you can trace this right back to Dr. Ruckman. From Jeff Faggard to me to Dr. Ruckman. You never know how God works. Isn't that amazing? All right. Let me give you a quick uh, outline this morning. Uh, turn to Genesis 9. I have, I, I have, listen, I have so many outlines I came in with this morning. Look. They're all over the place, huh? I did not know what to preach. I'm thinking a Ruckman guy in the middle of a crazy state, California, in the middle of COVID. Then I, then I thought I knew what I was going to preach until I pulled in the, the bottom of the hill here. Then I said, holy mackerel. And, uh, and as I went up the hill, and I, I, the scenery kept changing. I didn't know what to think. Then I ran into that one guy in here. Where's that guy in the back? Where's that, that guy back there? He and I got drunk in the same bar one time. Absolutely, we did. The Stone Balloon in Newark, Delaware. Stone Balloon is the, was the number one nightclub, in, number one college bar in America, according to the Rolling Stone magazine, opened up in 1972. The founder was Bill Stevenson, the former husband of Dr. Jill Biden. And he lost his wife to an affair with, you know, Joe. Joe stole his wife and stole the election. Nothing new, he's a crook. And uh, long story short, I sold the cash registers to that nightclub uh, to Bill Stevenson when he was married to Joe Biden when I was 19 years old. I was working for a cash register company. And uh, anyway, I'm saying I ran into him and we, we got drunk in the same bar. And I've been thrown off all the way up to just a couple of minutes ago. So I'm going to show you something very important to understand. Uh, take, uh, open to Genesis 9. If you take a Bible position on what, what the world would call the race issue, you're a racist. You understand that. And you let these people laugh all day and all night. I'm such a racist. I'm coming up the highway to get here this morning, and I got a text message from a, uh, from a preacher in Alabama that told me another uh, preacher friend of mine, Andrew McAfee, that his uh, wife had just had a miscarriage, and I just preached for that man. He has me rebooked this year. So I called him on the telephone to tell him how sorry I was to hear the news. His wife had lost a baby, 20-something weeks. He said, I, he said, are you still coming to my camp meeting this year? I said, sure, I've got it on my calendar. And then he said, Brother Tory's coming over from West Memphis and bringing his whole congregation. Now, who's Brother Tory? Tory Carter. He's one of five black preachers in America that have an all-black King James only pro Ruckman church. I've I've preached in two of them. I don't know where the other three are, but this guy was a gangbanger from uh, Omaha, Nebraska. If you he's about six foot ten, you know, 
uh, barefoot, and, when, and if he knows you're good enough, he'll pull his shirt up and let you see all his bullet holes and his knife wounds and everything else. And somehow he, somehow he got into, na into Navy intelligence or something. I don't know what he was doing. But he's a character. First time I preached for him, Pastor, he gave me a love offering and a 12-gauge shotgun to get out of the neighborhood. <laughs> I short, I already trimmed the barrel down since I've owned the gun. I'm not making this up. And uh, he's a character. And uh, long story short, he supports me monthly. I don't have more than half a dozen churches. And I, never, so I don't shake hands like a missionary. That's an old joke, missionary joke. Yeah. I, I, don't have, I don't solicit support, you know. But they come and they go. Sometimes people support me until they know what I believe. <laughs> I've had more supporters start supporting me than dump me like a hot, you know, dream there, a hot potato. Long story short, he's one of the ones I have left, and he loves me to death. Amen. And uh, when I was out there preaching for him last year, he wanted to put me in a nice hotel, and I said, I said, can I stay with Brother Dudley this year? Brother Dudley's one of his key members. Real nice man. First time I met him, I complimented his watch. He took it off and gave it to me. And uh, anyway, next year I was there and led his daughter to the Lord. And she loves me to death. And then one of his other daughters had a serious heart surgery procedure coming up. And we kind of did a lot of praying together. And anyway, I said to the preacher, can I stay with Brother Dudley? And he said, uh, oh, man, if you... If I tell him that, he's going to think the Holy Ghost is going to come into his house. You know, he's spooked out. You know, he, that's how much respect he has for me. Don't forget, God magnifies his servants. So I said, he, I said, let him deal with it. He can get over it. About two weeks later, I got a text message from that brother Dudley. And he said, Brother Grady, what's your favorite color? I don't know. What, besides white? I said, what do you want me to tell you? I don't know. I had no favorite color. I never thought of it. Only women do that. <laughs> Too many of you men got a favorite color. I mean, you, might like, you might like cats, too. So I said, uh, I said uh, pink. No, no, I said blue. Blue. No, I just picked one. I literally just picked one. And uh, a couple of days later, I got another text message. He said, uh, he said Brother Grady, uh, what's, your, what's your favorite soap? Well, I had an answer for that. I said Irish Spring. You know, I like Irish Spring. <laughs> I got a cake of it right now. And my, I said, I'm going up to the hill tonight to stay, stay at a, some guy's house up on the hill. I hope it's not the house on Haunted Hill. But remember that movie? Yeah. Long story short, two weeks later, I show up at the conference, you know. And then after the first meeting, I go to the guy's house. There's a bunch of blue washcloths and blue, ta blue towels and, you know, uh, Irish Spring soap and boxes. <laughs> He gave, me, he gave me a key to use through the week, you know, because I'm coming and going. When the week was over, I told him, I said, hold that room for next year now. And I handed him the key back. Now, don't forget, I'm a racist. That's the word on the Internet. Yeah, come on. Right, right. And Brother Dudley said, no, no, you keep it. You may be through here sometime during the year and need a place to crash. I said, well, where do you keep your valuables? <laughs> So don't let, don't let politically correct, insane people mess with your brain. Genesis, now, I, 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 can, I, I can save a lot of teaching here because you've been taught well. But you got three boys there, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. You know they go three different directions. After the Tower of uh, Babel, Japheth goes into Russia, hangs the left, goes through Europe, and over to England, across the ocean to America. Shem goes the opposite direction all through the eastern world and comes around to the Bering Strait in Russia and into Alaska, comes down past Sarah Palin's home, amen, and <laughs> fathers all the American, Native American Indians all through North, Central, and South America. And Ham goes due south onto the continent of Africa. That's why the word Ham means dark or burnt. I got quotes in that red book back there from the 1950s encyclopedias that teach this. Yep. Now, long story short, God said he was going to do something unique with that young man, Japheth. He said he was going to enlarge him. Yep. Now, that's a racist statement because that means he's going to do something with one that he didn't do with Ham or Shem. But he didn't check with anybody when he did. God's <laughs> kind of like that. But he's going to enlarge him. When I worked for British Airways in 1972, I got saved in 1974 to Philadelphia Airport working for them. I worked in Park Avenue first. We had just become that airline from a merger from BOAC and BEA. 
BOAC was British Overseas Airways Corporation. BEA was British European Airways. First line in the Beatles song back in the USSR. Anybody remember that whacked out song? First line, flew in from, flew in from Miami Beach, BOAC. Now, why did I say that? Because when I worked there, we had more network airline route miles than any aerial airline at the time. We flew to more, we had more mileage routes total. We flew to more places than TWA, Pan American, Braniff, all those carriers. Why was that all about? That's a leftover from a 19th century expression that all of you have heard. The sun never sets on the British Empire. Britain got so spread out that it was always daylight somewhere within their empire. Did God say he was going to enlarge Japan? You ready? I'm going to shock you now. I'm, don't fall down and hurt yourself. King, King James Bible could be true. God said he was going to enlarge Japan. And he did that. Why did he do that? So Japheth could consume his enlargement on his, on his lust, of his flesh? No, that wasn't God's plan. The plan was to get the gospel to the world. Anybody think there's more, anybody, any other nation get more missionaries out around the world than England and then America? Duh. Anybody want to take a guess what the word Japheth means? I know the preacher knows. I was just getting ready to say, I don't know if he knows, but he controls the love off. <laughs> you never make a pastor look bad when you're an evangelist. You laugh at all their jokes. You brag on them to death. <laughs> Hello, neighbor. Um, what was I saying? Japheth, what does it mean? It, you know what it means? It means beautiful. Thank you very much. Elvis has left the building. That's exactly what it means. Listen, if you don't think Japheth, if you think all the races are the same, you're on drugs. The Lord doth put a difference between Israel and the Egyptians. You ever read that verse in Exodus? Did you ever read that verse in Deuteronomy where God said he gave the, God speak, speaking through Moses to Israel, I gave thee power to get wealth? Did you ever read that? You, don't, you think anybody can, can, can scam a Jew when it comes to money? <laughs> Do you ever see a pawn shop owned by a, black, by a black dude and a customer was standing there trying to pawn stuff who was a Jewish customer? <laughs> Tell me what planet you came from. <laughs> Dr. Ruckman's favorite joke about the Jews, he said the reason that Gentiles love Jews so much is because Gentiles love money and Jews know how to make it. God gifted them above every, every race person in the world. The old joke used to be the... Um, the Jew comes into the village and the mayor meets him and says, we don't allow any Jews in our village. And the Jew said, that's why it's still a village. <laughs> <laughs> La ladies, help me, will you? H help me, Rhonda. I don't remember. Pastor, I'm sorry, but there's a lot of liberty in here. <laughs> I feel good. That's what James Brown said when he got out of jail. Yeah. <laughs> but I feel good here for, for real. That's liberty. You can't get that everywhere. But, you know, ladies, help me. I can't remember. What's the first three letters of jewelry? I can't remember. <laughs> you know, um, that my father grew up in Hell's Kitchen, west side of Manhattan, in the 1940s, at, hanging out as a teenager in front of the local jewelry store. He, he told me the story well, like when he's in his 70s, preacher. He still remembers. His goofy teenage friends, you know, Hunts Hall and the Bowery Boys, hanging out in front of the local Jew at the jewelry store. And he said that old Jew would come out with a broom, he said, smacking them kids chasing them away, and he says, stay, stay away from my windows and let the sun shine in on my diamonds. <laughs> now, God made them that way. Amen. Now, here's the deal. And by the way, the Lord just impressed me to show you a statistic. You want to, read, you want to hear some amazing statistics? These people that tell you a man is a woman and we all come out of an explosion, you know, that neutron bomb guy, that Jew, I witnessed him all the time. And I, one time I heard a redneck tell me something on a bus, and I repeated it to, to Sam Cohen, the father of the neutron bomb, and he couldn't say anything for about 10 seconds. He didn't know what to say. And there's a redneck told me this. He said, he said Brother Grady, 
You know why I don't believe in that there Big Bang Theory? <laughs> I said, no, how come you don't believe in that there Big Bang Theory? He said, because ain't no round things come out of explosions. Okay? Now, people that are women and say they're men and say they came out of an explosion and, you know what I mean, science falsely called. Now, here's a guy at Yale University, the number one historian of the 20th century in America, Dr. Uh, uh, Paul Kennedy, Dilworth Professor of History at Yale University. All right, when you write a research book, you put your references in the back of the book, like in a bibliography, right? Yeah. I may have three or four hundred books in here, maybe five hundred. That's how many books you normally would read to get your material to write your book, yes? Well, this key egghead at Yale has 1,800 books listed in his key book, uh, The Rise and the Fall of the Great Powers. That's the name of the book, right? You understand that? 1,800 books he read to write this one book. He wouldn't know JPEth from uh, Mickey Mouse, this guy. No doubt a lost liberal, you know, a lost liberal scholar, Yale University, 20th century. Can I read you the end of a quote he has here? I got the whole quote re reproduced here on page 58. In the year 1800, Europeans occupied or controlled 35% of the land surface of the world. By 1878, this figure had risen to 67%, and by 1914 to over 84%, footnote, end of quote. On the eve of World War I, bad old white people controlled 84% of the globe. I don't know, the King James Bible might be right. Who knows? He said he was going to enlarge Japheth. Maybe he did it. Here's his twin brother over at Harvard, Dr. Paul uh, Samuel P. Huntington, another twin egghead. He lists 14 categories in which descendants of European men have no second place close competition in the world. Western nations, that means white men today. And the reason this is important is because Coca-Cola is telling their employees to act less white. Right. You understand this critical race theory is going all over the place. That's right. Trump threw it out of the military a year and a half ago. It's in your schools, it's in your corporate uh, structure. It's everywhere. Okay, you understand, and, and now look. Let me tell you, because if, if you believe the Bible, you're a racist. God said he was going to enlarge Japheth, and bless God, he did. Let me tell you what the Harvard professor said. Here are the 14 categories. Western nations, one, own and operate the international banking system. Two, control all hard currencies. Three, are the world's principal customer. Next, <clears throat> provide the majority of the world's finished goods. Dominate international capital markets. Exert considerable moral leadership within many societies. Are capable of massive military intervention. Control the sea lanes. Conduct most advanced technical research and development. Control leading edge technical education. Dominate access to space. Dominate the aerospace industry. Dominate international communications. Dominate the high tech weapons industry. Those are 14 major categories. They dominate hundreds of minor le level categories. I don't know. Could the Bible be true? Yes, sir. When's the last time somebody from Asia or Africa gave you a gospel track? I bet you most of you heard the gospel from a European church, i.e. a white church now in America. We came from Europe. That's how America is considered. Did you understand that? I mean, the Bible might be true. Duh. Um, now, uh, let me show you that, th that, that this did not happen overnight. Let me show you a beautiful verse. Uh, turn over to Daniel. I'll be uh, Daniel chapter number 8. <clears throat> you know, the pharaohs come, uh, were in Egypt on the, on the dark continent. That was the land of Ham, yes? And, uh, and uh, so that's not, uh, that's, not J that's not Europe. Africa is not Europe, duh. Uh, you know, the ten northern tribes were taken into captivity, scattered by the uh, Assyrian Empire, Sennacherib. That's up there and outside of modern-day Syria. Where is Syria? Asia, Africa, Europe. Duh, Asia. That's Shem. Japheth wasn't doing diddly back then. But look at, look at Daniel 8. In Daniel 8, you got a dream that Daniel has of a ram by a river, a two-horned ram, like your 
your truck's got the two-horn ram on it, and then that ram uh, gets rammed <laughs> by a one-horn goat, right? Look at chapter uh, 8, verse uh, blah, blah, blah. If I stutter, by the way, that's my uh, Joe Biden impersonation, if I forget to tell you. <laughs> verse 5, And as I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. That's like Wile E. Coyote. Remember, spinning his wheels? He's going so fast, this goat. And did you notice where the Holy Ghost pointed out he's coming from where? What direction? The west, the west, going east, coming from the west. Yeah. Hello, neighbor. And the, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes, and he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river. Now, he describes where that river is in, uh, in uh, verse 2, and that's out there by modern-day Iran. Okay? How many of you like, uh, how many of you are you crazy enough that you like guacamole? If you can remember that, you'll remember exactly where Japheth came into existence and the world changed for the future forever. If you understand, it happened at guacamole. Can you remember that? I said, Brother Grady, you're strange, I know. Verse uh, 7, I'll tell you what that means in a second. And I saw him come close unto the ram. And he was moved with cholera against him and smote the ram and brake his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him. And there was none that could deliver him out of his hand. Now, if you, take, if you put notes in your Bible, not everybody does. In my Bible, I've got the word, I've got Genesis 9.27 written right down next to verse 8. Now, uh, I also have 330, 330, you don't have to do this, but I have 330 B.C. written there. Now, you know what happened on, on October 1st, October 1st, 330 B.C.? Right there at that verse, it was the Battle of Guacamole. No, it wasn't. I was so tired the other day when I was teaching this, I said that by mistake. I was tired. It's the Battle of Gargamella. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when that goat wiped that ram out. Now this is, in other words, what you're reading here, Daniel's getting a picture of something that's going to happen 200 years into the future. This is in the 6th century B.C. He's writing this. Now, if you want to know who that goat was, you got two clues. Number one, he's coming from the west. Number two, watch this one. Watch that King James Bible text. Look at verse 8. Therefore the he-goat waxed very what? Great. Hello. Look at verse 21. And the, this is when Daniel's interpreting the dream. And the rough goat is the king of what? Grecia. And the what horn? Great. The great horn that is between his eyes is his first king. Hello. You know any Greek kings that came in from the west that defeated Persia that had a nickname with the word great in it? Yeah. By the way, you go back to verse 8. You see what that, what that next verse says? When his horn broke off, he, he, he died with, uh, of alcoholism. You know, he's a sodomite, probably had all kind of diseases in his body. You know, he died premature death. After building a kingdom of 2 million square miles that stretched, stretched 3,000 miles from Greece to India in 13 years, a while like coyote. Move it. His horn broke off. Did you see the next verse there? And how many horns came up? Yeah. On his deathbed, they said, who gets the kingdom? He said, give it to the strongest. He had no male heir. And it divided up to four generals. Absolute history. That King James Bible is as exact as you can get it to be. Now, you see, what this is, is the fulfillment of the vision in Daniel chapter 2. When, Daniel, when Nebuchadnezzar saw that man standing in front of him with four parts of metal. Remember that? Golden head, silver arms. Brass thighs and two iron legs and ten toes of iron and clay. You remember that? I feel like I'm in a bar here with this. Cheers. Cheers. And uh, blah, blah, blah. So long story short, um, the... Um, 
So that, so that battle takes, oh yeah. So, you know, Daniel said, thou art the head of gold. And that's the Babylonian Empire, world empire. Where was Babylon? Iraq. Yeah. Is Iraq in uh, uh, Ham, Japheth, or Sham, Asia? Yeah, it's not Europe, right? And then they get knocked off by the two-horned ram. Two arms, Medes and the Persians. Where is Iran? Is it in Asia, Africa, or Europe? Well, I'm just playing with you, right? But see, God said one day he was going to enlarge Japheth. Didn't happen right away. And who knocks off the Medes and the Persians? Alexander the Great. Anybody want to guess where Greece is? Asia, Africa, or Europe? That's the beginning of JPEF's enlargement in the sovereign plan of God. So you could get saved one day. And then the Greeks get knocked off by the two, le the two legs, the iron legs of Rome, Western Empire, Eastern Empire. Kabish? How many of you know a good Italian word with four letters for goodbye? Bang. Who? Stop. No, bang. <laughs> okay. Very good. I just throw those things out to make sure you're listening. I just throw that stuff out to make sure you're listening. Now, let, let me leave you with an unbelievable nugget. I asked the preacher about the time. He said about five, at, five of, put the wheels down. And I, I, so I'm working real hard at uh, keeping track of the time. Let me show you an unbelievable nugget that God gave me about six months ago. I'm sitting on the front row here in a church in Kentucky waiting to get up go up to preach. And I was looking at this verse, and the Lord showed it to me sitting there, almost passed out. You know, I read a book in, um, several years ago, written in 1897, called After the Thousand Years by an author named Trench. If you want to know how deep those guys were before TV and Facebook and everything else, you know what that author said, Pastor? I never got over this. Totally blew my mind. He said, when you're standing on the shore... And the water, the ocean water is rushing up past your ankles like it'll do, right? Like the tide kind of coming in maybe, whatever, just wash it up. He said, when you look down at your ankles and you see that foamy water around your ankles, he said, that represents the amount of the scripture that God has opened up to your understanding. What did David say? Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. So that's what you understand right there. He said, the rest of it's out there. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you think you could ever scratch the surface of that book in a hundred million lifetimes? That's why you should stay encouraged to keep reading it. You may think everything's been found that's going to be found. I don't think so. Can I show you what the Lord showed me? Ready? Turn to Acts 16. When you get to Acts chapter 16, the Apostle Paul is finishing his third missionary journey, right? They were called Christians first in... Antioch, Syria, Shem, Asia, right? And uh, that's where, the, you know, the first church was in Jerusalem, right? Shem, Asia. And uh, so anyway, he's moving around up in Asia, covering the same ground he'd been covering. But the Lord says, ah, it's time to go after the Polacks and the Germans and the Irish. By the way, God bless you. And by the way, if you look at uh, Genesis 10, you know, the table of nations, right after the verse in Genesis 9, 27, that he was going to enlarge Japheth, you look at chapter 10, and it tells you where the descendants of Ham, Shem, and Japheth's line went. The very first one is mentioned. Japheth's got seven sons. The first one's Gomer. What a name. <laughs> How many of you know what uh, Jim Neighbor said when he found out Rock Hudson had AIDS? Shazam. <laughs> but anyway, I don't know where that came from. But long story short, long story short now, if you look at verse 6, Paul's moving around, doing what he's been doing, covering the same territory. Now, watch this. Look at verse number 6. My friend back there from the stone balloon, could you read verse 6 real loud for me? We'll make like it's a black church, and I'll have you quote, and I'll cut you off and make a few comments. Amen. <laughs> I preached in a number of them. I know what it's like. Go ahead, brother. Now, when they had gone throughout Pergia and the region of 
Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Oh, what about that? Holy Ghost, it, look, God's a racist. No Asians. Because they've had it already. He's going after the Polacks, I'm telling you. He's got to get the gospel to JPEG. When that, when that passage was written, Rome was in control of the world now. Second Japhetic nation in the prophecy of Daniel that's running the world now, yes? Okay, neighbor, but they don't have the gospel yet. See, first they got to get control, and then they got to get the message. What's the next verse say? After they were come to Mycia, they had stayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Pastor, I'll give you a good, you know, good uh, uh, clue here. When I've got verses, when I can't pronounce the words, I get somebody else to read them. <laughs> you know, a lot of techniques in evangelism, you know. If you got, a, if you got an invitation, it's not going anywhere, you know, what everybody's head's about. And it's, and raise your hand right now, you know, if something goes on, if God's speaking to you type thing, right? If nothing's happening, I shouldn't tell you this. Just, just stare at somebody's hand from the pulpit and look at it. Say, I see that hand. Everybody's got the head back. <laughs> hey, man, I'm not going down. You go down. I'm not going down. No, I don't really do stuff like that. Again, I told you, there's, there's too much liberty here. Hey, bank the thing down a little bit. This is not good. We're not going to make it through tonight. Long story short, hello, neighbor, to get the blessing out of this little nugget, and we're done with this. All you got to do is take a look, you know, take a, ma a look at a map of Israel, you know, Sea of Galilee, Jordan, Dead Sea, come on now, Mediterranean out here. Go due north. You go into Lebanon, Cedars of Lebanon up here. Hang a right, you go into Syria, the Golan Heights. Now, if you keep going up north, the landmass curves off to the left, and all of this is Turkey up here, Asia Minor, the seven churches of Revelation. That's where Paul is when you're reading these verses now. He's way up here. Now, if you go to the edge of that territory, you come to an ocean called the Aegean Sea in Bible days. Today, it's called the Black Sea, right here. Anybody want to guess what's on the other side of the Black Sea? Greece. Europe. Japheth. Your crazy barbarian ancestors, like Ruckman used to say. That's where the Holy Ghost is going right now. Okay? So Japheth, Paul, Paul's running around, and these, these places that he's mentioning are right here. Okay, what's your first name, sir? Charlie? Go ahead, Charlie. Read the next verse. And they, passing by Mycia, came down to Troas. Came down the Troas. They're coming down from the mountains. They're coming to the coastline. Troas is right on the ocean. Jumping off point, leaving Turkey. And go ahead, brother. I hope you have. I hope you men married up. Amen. I know this is a Ruckman church, but you don't have to be married 20 times. <laughs> I'm out of the house group. I learned how to stay married 46 years to one woman. It won't hurt you. Um, I'm sitting up in uh, Tennessee in my home about 2005. Okay, just got back from preaching Dr. Ruckman's blowout. That was the fourth blowout I preached at. I'm in my home on nine acres on House Mountain in Coryton, Tennessee, East Tennessee. <laughs> I'm reading an email. My wife's sitting next to me. We just got an email all printed off the computer. I hadn't even read it yet from a lady in, in Michigan. Her and her husband and another couple were trying to talk us into going up there to start a church. I hadn't said yes or no because I had no Holy Spirit leadership yet. But I wasn't looking forward to leaving the Smoky Mountains to go to Flint, Michigan. <laughs> you don't have to have the Holy Ghost for some decision. <laughs> Spurgeon said, God rarely calls a man to preach that has a lisp. Some things are just practical. <laughs> so I'm reading this letter, right? I hadn't read it yet. And watch the neighbor, my wife's sitting right next to me. I want to show you what kind of woman God gave me. And it said, said, Dear Brother Grady, we're still praying about you coming up here, but I want to ask you, doesn't the Bible say something about come over and help us? If you told me this, I wouldn't believe it. I turned right to my wife, Linda Grady, sitting right there. 
on the couch. I said, honey, I didn't say honey, wow, look at this. Oh, they're putting the burden on us. We better get praying some more. Anything like that? No, that's what I said. I said, honey, why don't we call it Macedonia Baptist Church? Because she's reading the letter with me. And she never said one bullet to me about that. She didn't like my smoking and other problems we've had, a lot of fights over other things. Joke. <laughs> to the shock. <laughs> Lord said, give him, a, uh, give him another Italian joke, quick, he said. How many of you know why Italians hate Jehovah's Witnesses? You don't know that out here? No. They hate all witnesses. <laughs> okay. Uh, hey, preacher said five of ten. It's okay. Now I'm one, I'm one minute after ten. It, it's your fault. Virtue's going out of me. Too much liberty in here. This is not good. We're never going to make it to the night. All right. Uh, 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 so we went up there and started a church. I was up there nine years. But, it, but, but look here. Come over into Macedonia, Alexander the Great's father, Philip of Macedon. That's right in the heart of Greece. Now, put your seatbelt on. Do you know where we're going? We're going into Europe to get over to England to get that book that's on your lap, to get the gospel around the world. How many times have you heard Dr. Ruckman say, if you want to know what time it is, you've got to go to England? Greenwich Mean Time. If you want to know where you are, you got to go to England. Longitude and latitude set over there. If you even want to know the temperature, brother, it isn't it didn't the Pollock thermal units. It's British thermal units, BTUs. And if you want to know the right Bible, you got to go to the Bible that came out in 1611. The book on your lap. Put your seatbelt on. I promised you a good nugget now. You better not fall down and hit your head and cause a lawsuit. Ready? Ready? Did I promise you something good? All right, preacher, read on. And after he had seen the vision, immediately he endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Them, Polacks, Europeans, right? Now, the next verse is the key verse that ties in back to Daniel chapter 8, verse 7, right? Back to Genesis chapter 9, verse 27. Here it goes. Loosing now, black church again. Hold, hold on, I'm, uh, I'm cutting right off, cutting you right off. Loosing, nautical term. They're on the coastline now. They're taken off in a ship. Loosing. Go ahead. From Troas, we came with a straight course. Came with a straight what? Course. Nautical, nautical term. They're on a ship. Go ahead. To Samothracia. Good. I didn't know how to pronounce that. Now hold it, hold it. That's a Greek island right in the middle of the Aegean Sea. Put your seatbelt on for the ending. Go ahead. And the next day to Neapolis. You see that Neapolis? That word means new city. When Paul gets off the boat there and hits Neapolis, that's the first time the gospel of the grace of God lands on European soil. A few verses later, a young woman named Lydia is going to be saved. First European saved on European soil. Cornelius is the first European, if he was a, from the Italian band, if he wasn't a mercenary from somewhere else, Roman Empire soldier, centurion, but he was in Caesarea when he was saved. Here's the first European saved in Europe. Hello, neighbor. Are you ready? Here's your nugget. What's the goal? Get that book out someday, right? Tell me what the reference is real loud. Scripture address. No, don't blow the greatest illustration in the history of the world. Thank you, everybody else, except for Charlie. Acts 16, what? What a coinky dinky. Somebody said a coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. Now, listen, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain back there. Pastor, come ahead. Thank you for being a great audience this morning. I think the devil could preach here. <laughs>